watch many tv shows um, mm, okay. as, as you are keenly aware because i yes. the whole of animal crossing and dragon age but um uh new episodes of the the newest show that i've been loving dropped and we've watched it as a family let me sing the praises of a little show called bluey <laughs> what bluey. what is what is bluey? bluey it's a it's a kid's show but <laughs> we watch it for my toddler i say half okay yeah. it is it is bluey has no right being as good as it is like it 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 is beautifully animated the music slaps the story <laughs> the go the, the stories are like heartwarming and like relatable it's the the acting which has real kids in it is great which who has good kid acting in kid shows and it's, sure. it's this little it's this little um company i think they're called ludo that animated in Australia. So it's an Australian centric show about an Australian family of dogs. Um, and it is the cutest, the most heartwarming show I've ever seen. And both me and my husband who like very different things, love watching bluey with our toddler who also loves bluey. And it's, it's, it's one of those, like how, how does a kid's show manage to rope in an adult man, an adult woman who have <laughs> largely different tastes and a toddler? Here it is. <laughs> it's bluey. Yeah, yeah, that's heartwarming and, and very encouraging. <laughs> I'm glad that that programming exists. Yeah. So and, and like, I, I, the, the story I wanted to tell is that there's this new episode, uh, no spoilers for bluey, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my daughter watches it. And she kind of just like, you know, she enjoys it. You can tell she likes watching it. She she likes to do little dances with the music. Um, but there is a new episode where a character has a very obvious um, uh, like gag for pooping. It's not like it, he's pretending to poop or whatever. Uh -huh. and my daughter cracks up. <laughs> every time. And I have never seen her like laugh at something that wasn't us tickling her. You know, that was the first time we really saw her see a joke, understand it, and laugh. And it was some character pretending to take a shit. And it <laughs> <laughs> it's a poop joke. It's, it's, it's a poop joke. <laughs> Baby's first poop joke. And she laughs hysterically every time. That's incredible. I feel like she's continuing the proud tradition of split the veil in some way. With this. <laughs> <laughs> she is my daughter. <laughs> but it is honestly just the cutest thing of her just like giggling madly every time this character goes... <laughs> plop and it just, <laughs> it just <laughs> on. so yeah i i and, and like look it, bluey is surprisingly deep i honestly really like bluey like there, there's one in the episode um slightly a spoiler for bluey forgive me but um the, where like you your first in, this is like season three or something you're first introduced to the mom's sister and you're like the kids are like why haven't we met our aunt before and it's slowly revealed that the aunt doesn't want to go see the kids because she cannot have her own kids and she's depressed about it like holy shit that's super deep for a kid's mm -hmm. show yeah <laughs> and it's just i don't know i i, I was thinking in, in the other day like i remember when my little pony dropped um and like i i just had like the internet was obsessed with My Little Pony. And it like people are like, oh yeah, it's really heartwarming. And I just really like the stories. I, I would like to say, I actually watched the first two seasons of My Little Pony because I wanted to know what the fuck was going on. Um, and I just want to say that anyone who says that, okay, there's people who like My Little Pony for nostalgia. You're, you're free of sin. Uh, no, it, it, you just wanted to fuck the ponies, guys. No, Bluey is actually hard for me. <laughs> my little, my little pony is vapid and like, yeah, it's like a friendship is great. I like friendship. No, Bluey is real and it's raw and it's great. My little pony can suck a dick and you want them to and you're a sicko for it. <laughs> Everybody's going to jail. Everybody's Katie's going sending to jail. everybody to jail. I seen your sins. I know what uh. you do, you bronies, you sickos. Uh, <laughs> nobody's gonna fuck bluey you go get away from bluey <laughs> yeah you see uh, but but uh but for real it, it is honestly a good show it is everything my little pony wish it was it's it's wow. uh, it's great um the end that's my that's my uh 
thing on on Bluey today. Well, good to know that Bluey is out there. Obviously, I have not seen it. I will just throw this in that I only appreciate with time how hard kids programming is. Oh, God. Yeah, so much garbage. When you're a teenager, you think the height of like simplicity and like, oh, this is so childish or whatever is a kid's show. But mm-hmm. a well done kids show is like a master class in writing because exactly what you said, like if it's good, they touch on like serious themes, but it's hit, done in a way that a child can handle it. There's little mm-hmm. stuff snuck in for bored parents who are going to yeah. be forced to watch it. So they're not yep. so bored. It's like it's a master class in writing when it's done well. So good to know Bluey's out there. Yeah. If, if you have kids and you're wanting to watch a good show, watch Bluey. I highly recommend. Two thumbs up for Bluey. Two thumbs up for Bluey. Um, another masterclass in excellent writing. Uh, oh, here has we been... go. One <laughs> of the patents with the veil <laughs> transitions. That was a pretty good one, actually. It's above yeah. our, our normal no, that standard. That is actually, it is. I'm proud. Um, is, is the latest <laughs> member of Bioware. Uh, I guess this week, um, by the time people listen to this, it'll probably be about two weeks ago, we learned that Mary DeMarle, um, up to this point, previously of Eidos, Eidos Montreal, I believe, um, has joined Bioware. Um, so specifically of course, specifically the Mass Effect team. Specifically, yes, specifically the Mass Effect team. Which I think that news it felt like it came out in two pieces. Like the first one was, "Hey, Mary Demarle's joining Bioware," and I yes. tweeted that out as like, "This is really good news." Like just in general, because mm-hmm. for those that don't know, she has been the narrative lead, executive narrative designer, basically the lead writer. The title varies, but essentially the lead writer of Guardians of the Galaxy, made by Eidos Montreal most recently, Deus Ex Mankind Divided before that, and Deus Ex Human Revolution. If you have not played any of those games, they are very well written. They are really, really good writing, and in particular, um, the Deus Ex games are, they're RPGs. They're immersive sims, but they're definitely role-playing games with dialogue choices and choice and consequence big time. Uh, and they're fantastically well-written. Obviously, teams of people do that, not just one person, but Mary DeMarle being the head of those teams in all those three cases was like, this is really good. When after that, like it was like a day later, I think it was um, Gamble, Mike Gamble, yeah, it was. who said, happy to share that Mary DeMarle is joining the Mass Effect team in particular. And then I was like, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> like I was through the roof <laughs> on that. Um, I think he said leading. I, I might be mistaken about that, but leading I'll, in a master. I'll look team. it up real quick. But. Um, but just having her on board and specifically for Mass Effect, because she has legit science fiction, like not just a good writer overall, but like specifically science fiction chops. Uh, I was I, I was ecstatic. I think I tweeted out, this is the best news that Mass Effect has had in years. And it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Gamble tweeted out that she is the senior narrative director. Okay. Yeah appropriate given her track record um again titles are always tricky because they could mean different things at different studios but that sounds like at least one of if not the person leading the the story crafting process for the next mass effect which is huge Mm -hmm. yeah i I, was something we were even talking about before it's nice to talk about someone joining the company for once (laughs) it is it absolutely (laughs) is uh, and it's one of the it's also one of those things where like it's kind of harder to talk about people joining because like they don't always announce who's joining mm-hmm. um bioware I, I don't even think bioware announced this this was like other gaming uh not studios but um uh journalists gaming that, like, press yeah yeah gaming press that uh, announced it um so yeah but uh yeah nice to finally actually talk about someone that's joining the company um, which they they've been hiring for this maybe not this position but a, like a lot of like lead positions um, for kind of both Dragon Age and Mass Effect for a while so I'm glad to finally be seeing those be filled. That's mm-hmm. a good sign. So it's it's very good to talk about a pickup. I mean, we yeah. have talked about several departures at this point, and and to your point, we don't always get to talk about the additions because um, sometimes they're just not as well known. In this case, it is, and so I was. I've been a big fan of these three games that I've specifically talked about that that Mary has been lead writer on. So I'm very excited to talk about it in general. Mm -hmm. But also, it's kind of like to use a sports analogy. It's like when you're a team that's won championships, but you have like MVP caliber. It's a team effort, obviously, but you've got like MVP caliber, all-star caliber people. 
and they leave and like a couple of them leave, a few of them leave. This is like getting that big free agent signing to be like, oh, okay, we're finally bringing in some of that all-star level talent back. And it just feels like, okay, okay, we're, we're kind of maybe moving back into that space that the team was in before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just really encouraging. Which I, I I haven't played any like Guardians of the Galaxy Deus Ex or whatever. So like, tell me a little bit about, I guess, what to be excited for. Because I, I don't know any of this. this uh, uh, Miss Demarl, is that her name? I think it's pronounced Demarl, yeah. Yeah, uh, Miss Demarl's work. I don't know anything about it. So specifically, so there are a few things that I think are worth calling out because they're, they're relevant just in general to Bioware-type games, but in particular to Mass Effect. Some of them are specific to Guardians, some of them are more specific to Deus Ex, mm-hmm. and then some are kind of in the category of both. Um, so to start off with, the one that I think is maybe most exciting for people in general is the one that's really specific to Guardians. Mm-hmm. And that is that that game has a great um, team dynamic, sort of team camaraderie feel, which... Mm-hmm. Everyone knows that like a lot of Bioware games are defined by the companions. It's all about building relationships. It's almost kind of like a small family, even if it's a dysfunctional family at times. Um, looking at you, Solus, over in Dragon Age. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Blackwall, all these people. You know, it's like Mass Effect 2. It's like this ragtag group of people who are like, some of them are assassins, some of them are felons, some of them are whatever, but the team comes together. Guardians has that in its source material, obviously, with the comics, with um, movies that have been done. But I really give Eidos credit because they crafted their own version of that mm-hmm. that feels different from, from just how, how Guardians normally feels. Um, the team, I guess it is a little bit hard to describe, but the writing does a great job of making you feel like you're along for a motley crew of folks who genuinely care about each other but they fight all the time they sort of bicker like siblings Mm -hmm. and the writing is sharp it's funny it's emotional in the right spots you care about people um and you genuinely feel like like as a player even though you're playing star lord you feel like a member of that team um through the ups and downs of the story and i just think that's something that with with all due respect to the writers who were in charge of of this of this other of Mass Effect Andromeda, I'm just trying to put it out there. Mm-hmm. They were trying to do that with Andromeda, and they they didn't do it as well as they've done it in the past. Um, I I, I, you know, I subjectively love Andromeda. There are pieces of the character dynamics and the party dynamics that are great in Andromeda, but overall, you know, people can go back and listen to the episodes we've done where we rank the companions, mm-hmm. and it's like it's not even close, right? Like the Andromeda yeah, I- crew falls short. As, as a side note, like I've been because um, we, we are still doing where we rate the games thing, uh, but I'm, I'm replaying Andromeda at the moment. Uh, it's a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. A little rough. A little rough. yeah. Especially like yeah. coming right hot off the press of the, the trilogy. It's like, oh, uh-huh. boy. Oh, boy. This is, a, this is something, huh? But uh, yeah. So I'm sorry to interrupt there. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> How's that PB? How's that PB friendship coming? Are you enjoying the PB material? You know, here's the, I, I think it was I think it was you actually who told me like because uh, the first time I played it, I I was chugging through it, uh, and I I, I almost 100 percent it. There was a couple mini quests I didn't do, but I, I did everything. I, I had a couple complaints, and you're like, you know, Katie, you should just like do the main quest like don't just do this like don't worry about all the side quests just do the main quest and like the companion stuff and don't worry about it so that's what i'm i'm doing and i've decided that pb as as a whole person is a side quest so i'm just not gonna worry about her and uh, <laughs> you know what my life's been great um <clears throat> that that being said i still have some complaints about some things but like you know we'll get we'll get there uh <laughs> so uh, yeah so yeah i guess i haven't been as annoyed with her because i have not been talking to her Mm -hmm. she's just and she's next to the escape pod and that's all we need to know she's yeah frankly if you could push the the button to make it (laughs) that'd be great maybe you can later i don't know uh yeah so so to to that type of point i think that's maybe the thing i'm most excited for which is that Mm -hmm. guardians truly captures the fun sort of aw shucks we're, we're friends um it's that thing that mass effect 3 in particular the citadel dlc got so right Mm-hmm. It's like you you try and you try and spread it on thick with this sort of ah shucks we're pals we're a team we're buddies going off and doing adventuring stuff 
And when that works, it's like heartwarming and funny and it feels cool and not overly dorky. But like when it doesn't work, it's uh, it's 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 cringe as overused as that term <laughs> is now like it is it's like it's just like, ugh, this feels really forced and weird. Um, I don't know what what specifically makes you know, a writer or a team of writers able to crack that, but they cracked it in Guardians, which is yeah. very encouraging to me for Mass Effect. Yeah. I I will say, like, just as a side note, like, Guardians on, like, the surface seems like something I would enjoy playing, like the like the actual, like, gameplay of it and all that, but I, I am just so sick of cape movies that I can't imagine enjoying a, a cape game i'm sure it's fine i'm sure i would like it if i played it i just don't want to go down that rabbit hole i guess you know i don't know yeah yeah the the combat i felt in guard was maybe kind of like one of my least favorite parts of it actually i thought oh. it was kind of repetitive and just a little busy it wasn't bad but it was like okay the combat sequence is over like i i really liked like the fact that in between missions you can walk around the ship and talk to your to your crew like like you do in Mass Effect like yeah it was really more that piece of it that I wasn't expecting from the Cape game mm-hmm. um, where it's like oh okay there's downtime like I can like put music on on the ship and then like go talk <laughs> to Rocket and like just kind of shoot the shit and like that's the part I love yeah that that game like from the little I saw of it because I, I think I just watched uh, whatever game demo was playing when it was being revealed um it it really did almost look like a bioware but a cape game so that that yeah so yeah i i i feel like she would fit in based on you know just that game alone um i i will say quickly i looked at her um, imdb and uh if you're a fan of the miss series she was also a writer on miss three and four yes yeah absolutely And uh, something called Dungeon Siege, which I don't know what that is. But hey, if you like that, there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yeah, that is worth noting. I'm I'm not a Mist person, but of course, Mist is is well known for its narrative, and so that's just just great to see. It's encouraging that she's got a track record that's sort of years long of of consistency, right? Like you yeah. could argue. I mean, I guess maybe we'd have to hear from the real big Mist fans how they feel about those, but I feel like the reputation of them is that they're quite strong from a story standpoint, and so uh, not a lot of misses in her in her track record. Yeah, most of the the games seem pretty solid. Like I've you know I I've yeah I've heard good things about them, um, and it looks like she's also been at least a narrative director of some sort since 2011. So like she she's been in her job for like 10 years. So like hey. I, I don't know. I, I'm also just like that. Call me sexist, but see a woman in a powerful lead. You're like, hell yeah, sister. Fight the <laughs> glass ceiling, whatever the fuck it's called now. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy she's joining. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm also happy. Like, I don't know. I, I liked the Mass Effect trilogy and drama, mm-hmm. but I like the trilogy. But I will say the trilogy always had this twinge of. Y- your male ship, you know, like it things just work a little bit better with male ship. And like, you know, F- femme ship has her own story. She's great. I, I, I love playing femme ship too, but especially with like, I don't know. There's just a little, some dialogues and work tweets like that. That's more aimed at a guy, like the whole like Liara thing. I know you can romance her as a woman, but just like, I don't know. It, it's very dude bro in some sense. So seeing a woman on the team, I'm just hoping that like, they kind of like make it a more in the middle where if you play as a female character, you're not so like, I don't want to say alienated, but you don't feel like, oh, this is the scene that's supposed to be for a dude and I'm playing a woman and they didn't count for it. So here we go. Because <laughs> that happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know that I, I'm very excited about it. You seem you're excited about it. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am definitely. Um, so a couple of other things, one of them we kind of already touched on, like, Yes. The, the next couple of points I would say are they're applicable to both Guardians and Deus Ex. They're in both, mm-hmm. but choice and consequence. Yeah. Um, to your point earlier about how like Guardians felt kind of like a Bioware type game, I think mm-hmm. that was the main reaction when the first gameplay reveal happened, maybe at E3 2020 or 2019. I, I'm, I'm forgetting I, which one it was, but everyone said, oh, this is like Mass yeah. Effect, Mass yeah, Effect Guardians. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> and so like that that holds up, right? Like that's not just a couple of sequences. Like there's dialogue choices throughout. Um, there's a approval system where it says like, hey, these characters approved of this decision. This character didn't approve of it. And it's not always like major, huge impacts to the story, but there are multiple endings. Mm -hmm. There are different states that your relationship can end up in with different characters. And again, just seeing that well executed is very good because that's what we're going to expect from something similar to that for the next Mass Effect game. So I'm like, that's Mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Did Deus Ex have a lot of that stuff or was it more like streamlined narrative wise? I think Deus Ex definitely has, well, it definitely has multiple endings, like Human Revolution in particular. I I like the difference of endings, even though it's ending slides. Like, I feel like the difference is, you know, you can have significantly different endings, at least in my mind. So it definitely has choice and consequence. Deus Ex is a little more protagonist specific. Like, it's mainly about Jensen and there are certainly supporting characters, but it's not you don't have those relationship states as much as you do in, say, Guardians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's the thing that I think is quite strong. Another one is the fact that, and I don't know if this is necessarily something that the writing gets to drive, but I do feel like the writing was, it was well tailored around this design choice. And that is that in both Guardians and Deus Ex, the world is non-linear, but it's not open world. Um, I guess it's what people call hub, what, you know, what a lot of people call hub worlds or hub levels where you're dropped into a, to a map. It's like sizable. Deus Ex Mankind Divided, to tell you the truth, feels small by today's standards as mm-hmm. far as like the areas, but they're dense. Like you can, there's there's multiple ways to get in and out of different parts of the map. And so you end up, traversing it and retraversing it um so it's it's definitely not open world guardians is definitely not open world that's kind of a design thing but from the writing standpoint i feel like the things that you get rewarded with for going down you know going the opposite way of the objective marker going into these nooks and crannies it's not just um it's not just um what's the words i'm looking for extrinsic intrinsic right like those two different types of players like it's not necessarily oh you found loot or you got an item it's you went down this alleyway and so there's this thing that you see that your companions will comment on and have a little conversation mm-hmm. i loved that like I, I love the fact that in guardians they'll even make fun of you for doing that like if you keep exploring <laughs> rocket or someone will be like why do you keep doing that like what do you think there's what do you think you're gonna find and (laughs) even when there's especially when there's nothing there he's like see i told you there's nothing over there (laughs) (laughs) and it's funny because it's like it's a gameplay thing of like is there loot here is there an item or a codex entry but sometimes there's not and the fact that the game was self-referential about that and also playing into your party member's personality i loved that i thought that was such smart writing Mm mm-hmm Uh, and also the co- and also you do find um, the the codex entry. So that's that's another one is attention to detail. Yeah. Deus Ex fans know this like emails are everything in Deus Ex. <laughs> like there's so much goddamn information about the plot, about characters, about the themes, about the world building. Like you find a fucking computer. You better read the emails on those on the goddamn computers in Deus Ex. And they're very well written from a world building standpoint. <clears throat> little clues Mm -hmm. Um, obviously sometimes you just need to find a code to open a door, but even beyond that, there's just great information that, you know, might explain some of the motivations of antagonists or other characters. And that stuff will never come up in a cutscene. It'll never be put front and center, but it really illuminates things about the characters and the world. Um, guardians has it as well, Mm -hmm. where you're finding codex entries, you're finding items, um, Finding items out in the world in Guardians can l- unlock conversations back on your ship, which I loved. Oh, you can cool. find something that's like, oh, this is from, you know, some conflict or something that was going on a few years ago. I think, you know, Drax was a part of that or whatever. So next time you're on the ship, you can say, hey, I found this thing and you can have a conversation with them about it. And I love that because it's exploration in the world leading to exposition and character backstory. Yeah. 
there's not, I'm trying to think here. There's not something specifically like that, but I feel like there's, there's bits of that in Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Um, yeah, like a little bit, sort of. Y- usually you don't like, it's usually part of a quest though, you know, like a, like Black Wall. Well, not really actually, because that's kind of just like a throwaway dialogue. It is a little bit more questy, but I guess the yeah. the feel of it, I'll say this, especially in Guardians, it if you love Dragon Age party banter, you'd love the Guardians um, <laughs> in, in that bantery sense. It feels like that, where it's just like, oh, we're walking through the world. They, they're not just they're not just characters who are going to attack the enemies like they have opinions they have fights <laughs> they have arguments <laughs> with each other uh-huh. um there's running jokes throughout the entire thing um like they have fights in a way where like you can you can take sides in the fights or you can be like a piece and it takes place over the course of like the whole game right so like oh is it like fighting know. over like silly things or like something that matters uh, it it's both right like it's like shit talking but then it's like ooh, there's they're hitting nerves with each other like do you want to continue encouraging them to shit talk because it's funny or do you want to like encourage them to be more at peace with each other that kind of thing mm. um i just think that that is like it's like bioware party banter but sort of almost taken to another level and i'm really excited about the potential for that like peeking into mass effect <clears throat> is is there anything else you wanted to talk about in the the games and something we could look forward to for Mass Effect? So yeah, so a couple of things specifically around science fiction. Uh-huh. Um Deus Ex is is I think some of the best science fiction RPG, you know, human revolution and mankind divided, like that we've seen in the past few years. Um it's without just like recapping the plot or whatever, it's very good at capturing. Um, so one of the main themes in both human revolution and mankind divided is the idea of augmentation, people mm-hmm. getting synthetic body parts on enhancing their, their physical abilities with implants and stuff like that. And it's starting to blur the line between, you know, what, what is a person, what is ethical, what is fair, what is safe and all these different things. There's, discrimination sometimes against people there's physical ramifications of people um rejecting their implants there's pharmaceutical companies that are basically they have like a monopoly on the medication that people need to safely you know for well, them that's to just not real reject life. Their imp- <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm saying like really poignant salient commentary etc mm-hmm. um and they deal with those themes with great naturalism i mean it it does sometimes get a little too big and a little too sci-fi spy bullshitty like a little bit but for the most part it stays very grounded and very like naturalistic um i love that stuff i think that mass effect although it's known for that sort of theme and commentary and stuff i think it could go even further i think i think maybe mass effect one does some of that stuff the best uh-huh. in its subtlety and i would love to see some of that subtlety come back from like mass effect one type of commentary i hope so because like i i think like with with stuff like that that kind of mirror the real world i really prefer the subtlety and not even about like what the message is saying just because like i'm just so f- fucking tired of the real world i don't want to be <laughs> reminded of it in the, mm-hmm. in, the, in the game i play uh Remember, kids, pharmaceutical companies are bad. They all are. All <laughs> well, cops are bad? No, all pharmaceuticals are bad. <laughs> <laughs> the, the acronym doesn't roll off the tongue as much. No, but yeah. what's, what's uh, APAB? APAB, <laughs> that, that works. APAB? Oh, all right, you're right, yeah. APAB. Yeah. Um, but no, like that that example specifically, it's, there is some real world, like as you say, like there is some real world element to that. But the direct issue is not like the issue of whether or not people should be implanting like robotic implants into their body. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not quite an issue that we face yet in the real world, right? Like the ethical dilemma of that. It very well could be, we might be speeding very quickly towards that. But to me, science fiction works best when it's supposing what problems, what new problems we may in fact have in the future that we don't have now Mm -hmm. versus 
trying to treat through analog some future problem that's actually like an allegory for one of today's problems, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I think science fiction is a lot better when it takes fictional issues that aren't real, but presumably or supposedly could be in the future rather than trying to shoehorn in um, a a real world issue from today disguised as a science fiction issue. I'm kind of looking at Detroit become human, to be honest. Uh-huh. where they wanted to tell a story about racial tension and instead they tried to tell it through people discriminating against robots. It's like, well, <laughs> if, if you want it. Well, yeah, and it's like, if you wanted to tell that story, then tell that story. Like, why, why are you trying to shoehorn that in by, by talking about robots? Like, you should just tell that story if that's the one you want to tell. Um, I, I think that Deus Ex has commentary to make and it's salient commentary and it's good and it's not avoiding politics or anything like that. It's taking it head on. It's just doing it in a very, um, it's doing it in a way that's really about the science fiction and, and not just trying to directly comment on 2022's politics, which I appreciate. Yeah. I do wonder where mass effect is going to go. Cause like if, if they're, cause no matter what, well, I guess not, technically true because there is an ending where you shoot star child in the face and you don't defeat the reapers but the reapers are for the <laughs> most part all destroyed so like what uh what's gonna be the plot i know there's been kind of some hints at like the geth or something um but like yeah i wonder if there are going to come back to that uh, organic versus synthetic life and like maybe maybe try to I i know a big question of mass effect was like what happens when organics and synthetics kind of start competing with one another? What happens? What's like synthetics always going to win, right? Maybe they're going to kind of return back to that in the Geth, um, which with what you just said, I can see a Deus Ex writer <laughs> coming in and being like, well, totally. we've kind of I'm not told this story, but told something similar. And I might have some cool ideas. So, yeah. Having, having just finished the trilogy yourself, do you have a, uh a favorite or kind of like a a theory that you would most like to see for them to continue off from? No. So, okay. Remember, I like Mass Effect. I do. There's a lot of things I like about it. However, I am a fantasy fan. I like Mm. the, like I like the fantasy tropes and the themes. And those are the things I think about. So when it comes to Mass Effect, I'm, I'm kind of done with it. If there was never another Mass Effect, I'd be okay. I, I have, played it i had a lot of fun the end it's great so like where to go next i i don't even know because i feel like you they just finished mass effect so thoroughly that i have no idea how you pick that back up which is why i get why andromeda happened because they're like well we don't fucking know either so we're just gonna go to a whole new goddamn galaxy we don't have to fucking deal with it so like that makes sense to me. So when I Andromeda kind of failed, and they, uh, I think more than hinted that we're going to go back to the Milky Way, uh, I have no idea what they're going to do, and I'm kind of interested to see where they go because, like, I, yeah, that organic versus synthetic thing has been pretty core to the series, at least the, the original, not so much Andromeda that I remember. Um, eh, no, there is a thing about Angaran being man or man made, isn't there? Uh, about the Angarans being created by the Jardam. Yeah, there was something like that. Well, I don't know, but if if they if they were trying to get there, uh, what the fuck? Sorry, I <laughs> for the first time my computer's live. It just like popped up saying, "Hey, we just scanned your computer for viruses, and it's all cool." Oh, thanks. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Windows Security. What? What? Okay, sorry. Um, that threw me for a loop. Uh, but. Okay, if, if <laughs> we started does... talking about synthetic life and your computer was like, hello. Hi, how you doing? I I would like a new graphics card, please. No, uh, but uh, yeah, if Andromeda does have an organic versus synthetic thing, they, they didn't really touch on it as heavy as, as the, the trilogy obviously did because it just didn't have the time. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess it, it almost has to include that just by nature of like, that's kind of something that Mass Effect asks a lot of. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, I guess there's not really a science fan, science fiction theme that I'm so interested in that I want them to explore. And I'm kind of just here for the ride, you know, <laughs> but what, what about you? 
I, I can see that. So I do want to ask this too. I know you're saying generally like, eh, one way or another, even if there's no other game, you wouldn't mind. But you did yeah. go through some length to get your ending, right? Which was this, the That's true. synthesis ending, yes. right? How would you feel if they said, look, it's too complicated. We can't, we can't figure, we can't let you have all the endings. We're going to canonize one of the endings. So let's say they go with destroy ending. Yeah. Do you give a fuck? You're just like, yeah, whatever. No, it's destroyed then. No, that's fine. I, I think uh, there's been actually a couple other games that have done something like that, but I can't name, name them off the top of my head. But the, here's the thing. That's Mass Effect. If they, they, they did that in Dragon Age, we're like, oh, hey, sorry, guys. Your warden's a dude, and he fucked the shit out of Morgan, and they're, like, together. Also, he looks like the, you know, that would bother me. The suddenly, that's in, then I would have an opinion. But, like, for Mass Effect with the different ending, and they choose destroy. It, it is one of those things, like, Mass Effect, I feel like, had this has this thing where there's definitely choices they want you to make and if you didn't make that choice they're like oh fuck uh uh yeah uh you let tally die i don't know here's not tally happy birthday um oh you let morden die jesus christ dude uh here's a guy that sort of looks like morden it's he's basically the same plot though you know like it's eh, i don't know like or, or like i thought okay so at the very end of the game um, if you don't romance for Liara, she still gives you like this mind wave thing and you like look at the sunset and like even if, if you don't romance her, she still like leans her head on your shoulder. I know it's supposed to be a friendship thing, but like in the game I was playing, she was my ex-girlfriend. So I was like, girl, back off. I'm with somebody else. I don't want this experience. <laughs> like it, there's a lot of choices I feel almost were. They happened no matter what you did. And so the fact that they would canonize an ending like destroy, which did kind of feel like the real ending because you get the the breath from Shepard at the end, like that wouldn't bother me as much. But in a game where Dragon Age, I feel like some of the choices, not all of them, but some of the choices are more open then that would bother me. Maybe I'm also more attached to Dragon Age. I don't know. Yeah. So so on that point, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying because for me who is so invested in mass effect and i am devoted to the to, to the destroy ending i don't think yeah. there is a legitimate indeed besides destroy it's like <laughs> 15 playthroughs of the trilogy 15 times i've picked destroy i will never pick anything else mm-hmm. if they just said synthesis is the canon ending i'm not gonna say i would lose my shit i would i think i would just say okay my head canon is that we're like almost in a different whatever silver timeline whatever term you want to use it's like this is the story they must have picked that they must have chosen canonizing that ending so they could tell this new story or this new set of stories and so i'll i'll eat what they're what they're serving but in my head it's still the destroy ending like it'll and that's the end of of that mass effect universe really yeah and and like the problem with that is that it's also like you're the guy who played it mass 15 times and you've click destroy 15 times but i'm sure there's someone out there who also clicks synthesis 15 times uh i would be surprised if there's a control person who picked it 15 times but hey that's you <laughs> hope you're hope you're well um <laughs> but but yeah i i feel like you're you're gonna step on some toes but but here's the thing bioware actually has um statistics on choices um oh no they do yeah yeah, yeah. so uh i do not know at the top of my head but i do know destroy is the most popular ending um yeah it goddamn well better be (laughs) yeah so the it's one of those things where like they can say statistically okay we're gonna step on toes but we're gonna step on toes the least amount of people so let's pick red because that's kind of where we wanted to go anyway and that's where most people want to go anyway so sorry green and blue and guy who shot star child in the face we gotta we gotta go red so you know yeah so yeah, I guess um in the comments, if you were are married to the synthesis ending, what would you do if they very clearly said like, well, I know you wanted that to happen, but nah, it's red. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and very very relevant to this topic, um, you mentioned earlier a second ago about how there are certain games that have done that. Uh, would you like to know an example of one of the <laughs> series that did that? It's actually Deus Ex. Oh, uh, oh. So, I mean, it's debatable because, like I said, there's multiple endings to Human Revolution. I feel, at least according to memory, and I guess it's been a few years since I played it, that those endings are pretty distinct. But the Mankind mankind Divided doesn't import your save file or anything like that. Uh-huh. It chooses to say, 
I don't want to recap the whole ending choices, but basically you can choose to reveal information that's the truth, but it's going to lead to, it's going to be very damaging, probably lead to more violence and chaos uh-huh. or keep the lie going because mm-hmm. technically it'll be less tumultuous for everyone. So There's the Washington actually a, ending. Very well. Yes. In that, in that sense. Yeah. Same premise in that sense. There's also like sub technically there's like four, not two, but mm-hmm. that's the main gist of it. Um, as I recall, what they choose to do in Mankind Divided is kind of like, well, whatever you chose to do or not do, it all got obscured by misinformation anyway. So it's still kind of unclear. Uh-huh. But the perception that a lot of players had, which is that like when you look at the world state and like how certain factions were affected, it felt like the bad ending was the one they kind of carried off with. Mm-hmm. Like they say it's either or, but it seems to fit more with like things seem to have gotten worse since the events of human revolution because of that critical moment at the end. So I think the developer said, no, we didn't choose to canonize the bad ending, but a lot of players were like, it kind of sure as heck feels like you did. Yeah. Yeah. That that's rough. Um, but it, it's not in, in a way it's not bad because it's like, well, we need the conflict to keep good. Like we need the, if we just kind of fixed everything at the end of human revolution, like that's going to make things a little too simplistic in the, yeah, and the sequel. That almost feels like one of those, like where the company just sat down, like, guys, do you want another one of these things or do you not? <laughs> right. What What do you want us to do? Everything worked out at the end, and then we make a new game. What the fuck do we do? Like, of course we're gonna make things in it. Like, yeah, I, I get that. That yeah, that kind of makes it didn't bother me at all. Like, I thought from from the in the first few minutes, you're like, huh, this is weird, and then after that, you're like, oh, well, this story and this plot line that they're telling in Mankind Divided is good. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm here for it. I'm all about it. Yeah, I would also be interested to see if like if Mass Effect then the next Mass Effect game even carries your choices or not. Like surely, like even Andromeda had a couple choices, and even then it was like really just male or female Shepard. But um, it would it have more than that? Or are they just going to say, look, we're going to try to make this as clean as possible? Because um, it's been Liar has been teased. Like the only thing that really guess carry odor is your shepherd's gender and if they romance the are or not and then after that we don't give a shit um because so far in the future or something like that but uh yeah i wonder if like they'll 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 not even ask let us be like this is the story of this shepherd maybe it's not your shepherd oh, that's actually something they could do this is a story about a specific shepherd it's not yours but we're just gonna go off and you'll have a new person you play and we'll go off of whatever i th- I think if it's a few hundred years or several hundred years into the future, which it seems like it certainly is because Liara's either matron or matriarch stage, one of the two. Mm. So it's at least a few hundred, if not several hundred years in the future. And if it takes place partially in Andromeda or partially in another galaxy, as well as the Milky Way galaxy, I think it's possible that they could explain the big pieces that they have to explain and leave everything else vague. The main thing they have to explain is why the Reapers aren't there anymore. Because if you choose the control ending, it seems like the Reapers are going to go around fixing buildings or some shit. I don't know. So yeah, they- I feel like that's actually not that big of a deal. Cause then you just swap some assets and you just have like, instead of a crane in the background, you have one of the sovereigns going, do, 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 do. I've been working on the railroad. <laughs> First of all, that's not what I was going to say, but fuck my idea. Let's do that. A reaper singing, I've been working on the railroad. You know. Somebody, <laughs> but like, somebody, do they all sound like Shepard, though? Because they have their all <laughs> It's just Mark Mir and Jennifer Hale. Their voices dubbed, like, combined. <laughs> like, almost like Star Child, but without the modulation. And they're singing. Uh, somebody call Drew Carpition and tell him what a, what a great continuation of his idea. The re- this is with the Reavers. Um, so yeah, okay. So that's one route. <laughs> I, I was gonna say too, like it it would probably be very easy to say if you chose Synthesis or if you chose Control. Um, we don't know what happened, but one day the Reapers just up and left. Boom. Right. That's only a couple lines of dialogue versus the Reapers all got destroyed. Like you could. If it happened hundreds of years ago, it's not like people are going to be talking about it all the time. If someone references that portion of history, you just have that dialogue have a couple of different lines that we, we destroyed all the Re- Shepherd destroyed all the Reapers, or one day the Reapers just decided to leave back into dark space. We never saw them again. Or, or you can or you can even say like 
So you know how like the Reapers, um, they're like uh, made of our, uh, you know, our people. Uh, some people thought that was kind of creepy. So we decided to just put them off off worlds that you're not going to go to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's another thing you can do. Yeah. Just uh, someone actually recognized like a relative member and like a Reaper that was building a, a road and things just kind of got weird and some lawsuits. So we just decided. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> same thing with like if you t- if you talk about the destroy ending. Oh, okay, the the gas, the you know, all the AI or whatever. It's like that was hundreds of years ago. Like people built new AI. Yeah, that was my big thing with picking destroy. And like, oh, what about what about you? Do I'm like, like it just destroyed the AI. Could you not rebuild it? You built it the first time. Y- you right. still got the paperwork. <laughs> like, um, the the gas do not have to be wiped out. It's it's established that they were trying to go like into the deep deepest parts of the galaxy like to the edges of the galaxy i mean it's very easy to say like there was a contingent of geth who were hanging just outside of the edge of the milky way galaxy they weren't affected by it they came back they rebuilt the geth yeah like you can still have the geth um for the for the synthesis ending it's a little bit trickier but i think it's within the realm of possibility you could say something like look that affected everybody who, who was obviously alive at that moment it's not like everybody born continues to be all synthesized or whatever. That was like a one, it lasted one generation. And and maybe there's a couple of people who chose, whether you chose the synthesis, the synthesis ending or not, some people kind of went down a synthesis path. I can't speak. <laughs> synthesis path themselves. Um, but you could also just say like, people didn't continue to be born that way. It was hundreds of years ago. Mm. That was just a thing that happened. I think you could handle it that way as well. Yeah, yeah. Here's Here's a question. <clears throat> that I that I see debated all the time. Um, do you should we call the next Mass Effect Mass Effect Four or Mass Effect Five? <laughs> um, I think that ship has sailed. I think once you do Andromeda, you ru- you you can't answer that question effectively, so you have to go with subtitle. Yeah, I I think so. I I'm also the opinion that Andromeda is spinoff and if you're going to have a, another game set in the milky way that is mass effect 4 you have some like it's there it's like a different series it's not quite much the same thing not to say that mass effect isn't or andromeda isn't a mass effect game even though it doesn't feel like one uh it's it it is it's just a spinoff and therefore is not a part of the numbered series um i i, I there's tons of things that do that and i cannot think of one for the life of me right now uh, well, well, Call Star of Duty is the worst one. Oh, I mean, I oh, Call of Duty is the worst one, and I <laughs> I kind of hate that. So, and that's totally subjective. That's just a me thing uh-huh. of like, oh, it's Call of Duty four after we've done <laughs> fucking twelve of them or whatever. Yeah. Um, I to me to me, Mass Effect Andromeda was the sequel to the trilogy, and and you can't ignore it. And so, it, it's it's it is the mainline series. Um, but that's just me. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess it just doesn't feel like a sequel to me. It feels it does feel like a spin-off to me. Like not not that spin-offs are necessarily bad. Like I I think like like I just said the the Star Wars thing. Like you have the mainline Star Wars, the so 1 through 9, I think. I don't know. But then you also have your Mandalorian, you also have your whatever. You have I don't know Star Wars that well. <laughs> but it's it's not like Star Wars 17. It's just its own TV show. It's an Obi-Wan show. You know, it does whatever. And and I kind of feel that way with Andromeda, just because like I feel like it, the Mass Effect trilogy is the Milky Way, like it's so so centered on that. And the, like Andromeda made such a big push of this is something new. This is new. This is different. This ain't your mama's Mass Effect, you know? Like <laughs> it, it's very different. And I think because of that, it does feel like it's separated it's separated in themes and how it looks and how it like plays and everything and i think that's on purpose and i think maybe they were trying to like just reboot the series like a soft reboot the series and it just didn't work for various reasons um but yeah i guess the next one i think it depends on because like that one teaser we had um they kind of tried to hint that andromeda would be included in the next game so i don't know if this is going to be like a five where andromeda like that they're going to put plot points of Andromeda in there, which means Andromeda is in the mainline series, or if they're going to be like, well, Andromeda happened and we will acknowledge it, but like, you don't really need to play it. Therefore it is a spinoff. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like whatever game 
is going to come out next is really going to be telling of what to call Andromeda, a mainline or a spinoff. I, I think you're right. I, th- I think we will learn a lot when we figure out what the title is going to be. To me, I I guess Andromeda fits the description of sequel series or sequel. Maybe it would have been a trilogy or whatever it is. It's not. Maybe it isn't a direct sequel. I guess I said it was. Maybe it's not a direct sequel as much as it is, again, to use the Star Wars analogy, like the sequel trilogy is like a sequel to the series. Um they're talking about doing a Game of Thrones sequel series that like follows Jon Snow, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's not a direct sequel. It's it's like another series, um, sequel series. That's how I look at that's how I look at Andromeda, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe the next Mass Effect is a sequel series to the Andromeda series, even though there was only one game in it, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I almost want them to do another Andromeda game just to like get it right i guess because <laughs> mm. it some is kind of that yeah I, I know it has an audience i i am not that audience but there there's sometimes i'm playing i'm like you know what i do want to know the answer to this question and i know it's not out there um am i so invested that i would like if i wasn't like doing the channel thing i'd definitely play it i don't know maybe maybe not maybe that's what ea's thinking and they're trying to do something else but um yeah, I don't know. It it is kind of sad that like like the Corian arc, there was supposed to be the fabled Corian arc DLC that never saw the light of day that I think even got turned into a book. But um, great novel, by the way. Yeah, it's I, very I, good. I still need to read that stupid thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I that never materialized, and I wish it had just to see like it, could Andromeda have been really something with like another year of polish and like. Uh, some DLCs. It might have. It just unfortunately ran out of time and money. So we got what we got. I mean, there's there. it's torturous to see some of those interviews with some writers who who worked on it, some of which are no longer even at Bioware, who a lot of the questions that we had, like, they, they were going to try and do it. Like, they had a whole thing for how First Contact with the different species was going to be a lot more drawn out and how they were going to figure out things like translation and there were going to be more alien species and there were going to be more planets. There was going to be all of that. It's not like they didn't write it. It was just a production thing where they just had to keep cutting. Yeah. I do wonder if like one day someone either has, has the cojones to do it and they just like, Hey, here's all the stuff we worked on for Andromeda. And here's all the things that could have been, might not have been good, but here's all the rough drafts. Here's all the concept art. Here's all the whatever. And like, if you know, if you guys want to head cannon or whatever your way through the next Andromeda, here's here's some tips of things we were going to do, and just to see like what could have happened in, in you know production. It, it it's hard, like just because you have a, a good writing team or whatever. Like sometimes the tech doesn't work, which is what uh, happened with Andromeda, I think, where like mm-hmm. they really had this no man's sky idea type of thing, is what if I remember correctly, and it, they just couldn't get it to work right on Frostbite. So it's tough. <clears throat> I maybe in the Bioware thirty five book <laughs> they'll cover it. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> Or the 30 book, that one's closer. <laughs> but um, yeah, Bioware 50, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, whatever they end up calling the next Mass Effect, I'm down for it. If it ends up being Mass Effect 4, I'm like, all right, it's Mass Effect 4. Let's do it. Yeah, I don't I don't mind either way. But it's just interesting, like, because uh, I was uh, looking at uh, Twitter to see uh, if uh, Demarl was, like, what, what her title was from that one tweet. And uh, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, it's Mass Effect 4. And we're like, oh, it's Mass Effect five and like people arguing about it it's one of those like it's not that deep just God. <laughs> <laughs> deal with if, it if it was four in a weird way that's a bold move like honestly like it's a bold yeah. move to call it four and so i even though it's not my top choice there would still be a, be a part of me that's like okay props credit you're sending a message fair enough yeah um but yeah either way uh, mary tomorrow Tremendous writer by track record. Um, I'm very excited that she's joined Bioware in general. Um, obviously, right now, it's to focus on Mass Effect. I, I I would love to see her work on really anything that Bioware is doing in future. Yeah. But for now, Mass Effect, I think, has just uh, gotten a big win. Yeah. It's, like, from what you've told me, it sounds like she's a great hire and perfect for the team. And 
Hopefully no one ever watches our show except for fans, because I am always mortified at the thought of being perceived um, by people who know what they're doing when we don't. Uh, but uh, good, good <laughs> luck to, to Miss DeMarle and the team. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that what you're working on works out well. Yeah. Um, all right. I think that's about it. Um, Katie, where can the folks find you? They can find me on Twitter as Gildathon and on YouTube. And that's all I kind of have time for nowadays. <laughs> but <laughs> where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at the Exalted March on YouTube and Twitter. All right. And with that, Darshara. <laughs> <laughs>